Well, it's good to be here. Uh, welcome, welcome everyone. So today we're going to talk about food safety. Everyone should be interested in food safety, right? We have a, a number of interesting um, topics um, coming up. A lot of them will be practical, so we'll be doing stuff. We'll be canning food. We'll be making jams and jellies, uh, dehydration, dry foods. Uh, but you know, this is this is also interesting too. So let's talk about food safety because this affects everyone. So the topic is basic principles. We're going to cover basic principles of food safety in the kitchen and also in the in the workplace. So um, feel free to ask questions as, as we go. I have a number of slides, um, but it's okay if I don't get through all of them. Um, it can be as interactive as we, we, we need. So if you have a question, just, just show. So here's a fact. The food safety system in the United States is the safest in the world. You know that? But before we start cel celebrating, let's look at this, the statistics. I mean, 325,000 people get hospitalized from just eating food, normal food, right? You, your lunch, right? Your dinner, your breakfast. People get sick from, from eating foods that are contaminated. 3,000 people die every year. What? I mean, five, not 3,000, 5,000 people die every year as a result of eating contaminated food. I mean, this 325,000, that's inching close to almost, almost a, a thousand a day, right? 890 to, to be exact, but that's a lot. So who are the people who are mostly affected by foodborne illnesses? Who, who are most affected by contaminated food? So this image, it gives you a clue. There are four groups of people. Can you identify the four groups? Children. Children, yeah, children. Elderly. The, the elderly, yep. Yeah. And pregnant women. And people, people who are, who are sick. sick, who are sick, yeah. So those are the, the, the four, four, four groups. Uh, and why? Because they are immunocompromised. We call them, we refer to them as immunocompromised. Their immune system is not at their strongest at that, at that time, so they're, they're pretty vulnerable. So what cause foodborne illnesses? Well, bacteria, viruses, you know, things, things like these, right? Uh, foodborne illnesses are mostly caused by viruses and bacteria. So it, you know, we talk about bacteria all the time, but what do they look like? Well, this is what they look like. So here's an example of, of, of bacteria and what it looks like. It's a single cell, a single cell, and a single bacteria. Probably we shouldn't be too scared of a single bacterium, but guess what? They multiply. And so they, they start with just one cell, but that cell divides and you have two. Within 20 minutes, you have two. Another 20 minutes, you have four, then eight, then 16, and it keeps going on and on and on. As long as they have enough nutrients, they will continue to grow. And then we have, we have viruses. I, I asked my students this, I mean, viruses, are they living organisms? Are they living? And a lot of students will nod and say, yes, they're living, but guess what? You know that they're not living? They're basic, they're simple, um, they, they just have they have genetic material, so they have DNA and, and RNA, and they have proteins. But we, we don't say they're living because they can't multiply on their own. In a bacteria, they're independent. They have everything that they need to multiply and grow. Viruses, they behave like parasites, right? So they have to get into your cell in order to survive and to, and to grow. They basically hijack the machinery of your cell in order to, to, to grow. Main sources of pathogens. You see this big word, pathogens? It means uh, uh, any uh, bacteria or virus that will cause you to get sick. So microorganisms that cause you to get sick or that can kill you, right? We call them pathogens. These are the three main sources. Fecal material, soil, and contaminated water. So you see the importance of washing your hands and keeping, you know, when you go to the toilet, you know, you certainly want to wash your hands and encourage your kids to, to do that as well. Uh, you want to keep soil, dirt from your, from your cup, your plates. Um, you know, you certainly don't want to be drinking contaminated water. Uh, I 
we have a concern here in in Ohio recently with that, that train derailment, right? People are scared the train fought it because of um, chemical contamination. So bacteria, they have superpowers. What are their superpowers? Well, they can spoil food, they can make you sick, they can survive in a wide range of different conditions. Very hot, very cold, salty environments. Your skin, it's very salty, right? You have certain bacteria that live, they thrive on your skin. Some like acidic environment, some like low acidic environment, some like oxygen, some can live without oxygen, and some can survive for years without food or water. What if we could do that? That's a superpower to have, right? I mean, survive for years without food and water. Some bacteria can do that because they're, they're able to make spores, and these spores are like seeds that can sit dormant for many, many years until um, the nutrients or moisture is present, and then they will start growing again. So they have super powers, but most of the bacteria that cause you to get sick, here are their characteristics. It's important to know this because we use this to um, get rid of them, right? So we know that most of them like oxygen. They are aerobic, they like oxygen. So what can we do to get rid of them? Well, we can remove the oxygen, right? So we can vacuum pack, right? So we can do that or we can flush the oxygen from out of the package and put carbon dioxide in. Uh, most of them uh, can survive in very dry conditions. So we talk about dehydration and why we do that, right? One of the reasons is to prevent bacteria from growing because they don't survive very well in very dry conditions. They don't like salt. Why do you think we salt food? It's a good bacteria to prevent them from growing, right? Uh, most of them don't like a high sugar environment. We're gonna make jams and jellies. One of the reasons why we put so much sugar in jams and jellies is to keep all these microbes. Many of them, and most of them, don't like acidic environment. When you're making a sauce, which acid do you add? You add vinegar, right? You add vinegar. Why do we add vinegar? To prevent the growth of, of bacteria. We also know that uh, most uh, bacteria, they don't like environments that are too hot or too cold. And so we can control the temperature and environment. Viruses. What are their superpowers? Do they have superpowers? Yes. They can get inside of your cells. They can reprogram your DNA. You know that? They can actually get in your cell, reprogram your DNA. That's, that's, that's what they do. So viruses essentially have, um, they have a, either RNA or DNA. They have genetic material. When they get inside of your cell, they put, they are able to put that, their DNA, their genetic information inside of your cell basically teach it, teach your DNA how to make viruses. That's what it does, right? So they hijack your cell and convert your cells into a viral battery. Make all these little critters here. Do you see them? Well, yeah, that's what they do. They have superpowers. Um, most viruses, though, they are killed by heat, even low heat. Uh, 140 degrees Fahrenheit, you know, we, we boil at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. So even a little bit of heat, a little bit of cooking will kill uh, viruses. And a little bleach, a little sanitizer will also um, destroy them, right? So let's talk about what these critters can do to us. You've heard of infection, but I wonder if you've heard of intoxication. Only when we think of intoxication, we're thinking about drinking alcohol, right? But, you know, bacteria that can intoxicate you as well. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you how. Uh, infection, there's a difference between infection and intoxication. So infection, that is when the bacteria get inside of your body and they multiply and cause you to get sick. So they damage tissues, damage cells, and they make you sick, right? Um, you have diarrhea, you have belly cramps, you have nausea, fever. Those are typical symptoms of an infection. How is intoxication different? Some bacteria, what they do is they make these toxins. So they will get inside of your body and they will make toxins while they get inside. Or 
they may infect your food, eventually die, but before they die, they produce toxins. And you eat that contaminated food, it doesn't have the live bacteria, but it has the toxins, and you get sick. And here are the typical symptoms. Tingling of the extremities, your finger, fingers um, tingling. There's dizziness, you feel paralyzed, headache. Anything that, they tend to affect the nerves. And so that's why you see those symptoms, blurred vision. Hmm. Here are some examples of common pathogens that uh, we should be aware of. Is five germs, the top five germs that cause illnesses. Norovirus, have you heard of these? Norovirus, salmonella, you've heard of salmonella, right? Salmonella, uh, Campylobacter, staph, have you heard of staph? Yep, staph, and then there's Clostridium uh, as well. So the five germs are caused in less from eating food in the, in the US. And let me uh, briefly run through these. Uh, norovirus, uh, that's, it's called the stomach flu, of course it's a virus. And uh, notice the source here is fecal material. And you will see this coming up time and time again, feces, exposure <coughs> to feces, uh, whether it be human feces or, or, or animal feces, you know, it can cause a whole host of problems <coughs> because they're festered with viruses <coughs> and bacteria. <coughs> onset, notice I have onset here, 12 to 48 hours. What do I mean by onset? So I ask my students, what do you think onset means? It's the time between when you, at the food, the contaminated food, and, you, and the time you start seeing those symptoms. And so the onset time here is between 12 and 48 hours. So between 12 and 48 hours after you have eaten that con contaminated food, you start feeling these, these symptoms. The onset time varies. You know, most times we blame the last thing that we ate. Don't we do that? <laughs> we be, yeah, it's the last thing that we ate that made us sick. But do you know that sometimes it's something that you ate five days ago. Because the onset time can be that long. And in some cases, it's something that you ate a month ago that just, that's just making you sick. So how are you gonna know, right? So we're gonna blame the last thing, right? We're gonna blame the last, last, last canned food that we ate, the last sandwich, whatever, <coughs> the last chicken. <laughs> but the onset time can be very long. Salmonella, the onset time is up to three days. Salmonella, um, where does that come from? The source is intestine intestine of animals and humans so again exposure to fecal material always important to wash hands properly if you think you're exposed to any form of fecal matter wash clean sanitize campylobacter up to five days again look at the source intestine of animals and and humans fecal <coughs> exposure staph where do we see staph on your skin right that's where you and your nose, you know, when you when you cough, you cough in your hands, make sure you wash it right because you know okay, you're gonna have exposure to, to stuff. Um, or you're gonna expose people to stuff if you don't do that. Uh, so it's common in skin and the nasal passages. Onset time one to two days. And again, you know, I will ask my students, what's wrong with this picture? So this person is chopping up some vegetables. Do you see anything wrong with the picture? There's no gloves. And when we're at home and we're chopping up vegetables, we, we don't normally wear gloves, right? But what do we do? We wash our hands properly, right? Um, the thing I want, wanted them to point out is the ring. Yes, so the I ring, it. yes, That's you right. thought about it, <laughs> yeah. yeah. You see, it's really difficult to clean underneath the, the, the ring. And especially when you have these fancy rings that um, has all these different markings on it, it's, it's hard to clean. Because those may look, those are tiny, but they can hold millions and millions of, of, of bacteria cells. And so it's always good, although some people, you know, they can't, they can't take the ring, ring off, <laughs> right? Um, and so in those, if you can't take your ring off to wash your hands, yes, you need to wear a glove, right? If you're doing it for yourself, okay, fine. You don't need to do that, right? But if you're preparing for <coughs> other people, it's really important. Take that, take that ring off, right? Wash or, or wear, wear gloves. Um, Clostridium, and this is called the um, Clostridium perfringens. That's the cafeteria germ. Um, why is it 
it, it's, it, it lives in very low oxygen environment. Uh, typically, Clostridium does that. Why is this a low oxygen environment? Uh, because, look at the steam table. So the steam table, as the steam rises, get what? Get, guess what uh, is lost? Oxygen. So the steam comes up and all the oxygen is gone. And so this environment here is very low oxygen. And Clostridium, they love that, right? Some bacteria, they hate, I mean, oxygen is poison to them. <coughs> and Clostridium is, is one of those. Oxygen is poison. Uh, and so they will thrive in this area. So guess what? what? What do we do to prevent that from happening? We keep it hot, right? We keep the steam, steam table hot. But what if the temperature drops? Somebody wasn't paying attention. The, the temperature drops. What do you think the Clostridium is going to do? They're going to take advantage. They're going to grow. People eat this food. They're going to get sick. Um, let's look, let's change gears now to look at pathogens that are most likely to send you to the hospital. So some might get you sick, but you're not going to be hospitalized, right? So those are the ones that we talked about. These are the ones that will send you to the hospital. Clostridium botulinum. Um, there is uh, a cosmetic that some people, you know, Botox, you're familiar with the Botox? Yeah, Botox is actually, it actually come, come from that bacteria. Yeah. Clostridium, that's the most dangerous toxin known, known to man. But a really, really tiny amount can be used for cosmetics, and it, and it works very well, but really, really small amount. It causes paralysis, right, of your, of your muscles. If it's carefully used, it's excellent for um, cosmetic purposes. But um, in food, you certainly don't want, want that. It can, it can kill you. Clostridium, listeria, we have the E. coli, and so we're in Ishirishi E. coli, we just say E. coli, right? Most people will just say E. coli. And then there's Vibria, which is a bacteria as well. Notice, um, so this one is uh, Listeria. <clears throat> the onset time, three months. What? Three months after you eat that sandwich, you're just getting sick. Now, listeria is known to cause spontaneous abortion in pregnant women. So pregnant women need to be very careful um, eating these uh, deli foods because listeria is known as a citrophile. It likes environments that are nice and cold, right? Your refrigerator. They will grow in your refrigerator. Most pathogens prefer warm temperature listeria. They like <sighs> cool. And so these deli, deli meats, um, you, you, especially um, you know, pregnant women have to be so, so very careful. E. coli, uh, onset time there is two to five days. Again, fecal exposure, right? Because where do we find them? In intestines of, of humans and, and animals. Vibrio, um, you, have you guys tried this? I certainly have not. I mean, I, I see people eating these oysters raw, you know, just hey, open no. it and just, Oh. <laughs> I don't think I could do that. <laughs> some people do, and they, well, they, they enjoy it. You know, just put some, um, some spice on it, and just. But it's dangerous, you know, because um, you're talking about exposure. You're eating raw food. There's no sterilization. I guess, uh, well, the lime juice helps a little bit, right? And the spice might help a little bit, but uh, I would trust that. <laughs> Right? Yeah, spicy, spicy food. You, you like spicy food? No? I like spice, but not too much. No. no. I, I don't like pain when I'm eating. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so sushi, which is so popular, mm -hmm. that what sort of governs that from getting... It, if it's not careful, the, the good thing is that inside of the meat is usually mm -hmm. sterile, you know, in, inside of it. Um, it all, all depends on how it is prepared, how it is handled, how it is, how it is prepared. Um, but yeah, there is that potential risk uh, as well. If it is not properly harvested and, and, and um, handled well. I've never had sushi. sushi. <laughs> Have you? <laughs> Have you? Okay. Yeah. yeah. I guess I'm not that brave, right? <laughs> But uh, we don't hear of a lot of people getting sick from, from eating sushi because of the care that goes into the handling and, and preparation uh, of it. But there's always that, that risk, right? 
Um, there are other hazards, of course. We talked about biological hazards, so there's bacteria and viruses, but there are physical hazards. There are chemical hazards as well. Uh, what do I mean by physical hazards? If you, you're eating, have you ever been eating rice and you, you bite into something that's hard, right? You, you, you hear a crunch. Oh. Maybe it's a stone or something, that, that's a physical hazard. If you see a fly in your soup, oh, that's a physical hazard, right? I found a, I think a roach in my rice once. Oh, okay. Yeah, many years ago. <laughs> I was at a cafeteria. <laughs> oh, that was awful. Yeah. <laughs> um, if, what can these do? These things, they can cause injury, of course, if you bite into glass. If there's a piece of glass in your food, and you bite Ooh. into that, you're going to get a cut. But mental anguish, you know, seeing that roach in your food, oh, mm -hmm. that's mental anguish. It, it causes that as well. Um, so here's a question. Bone, in boneless fish, you, you bought boneless fish, and you found bone in, in it while you're eating. Now, is a bone a physical hazard? It's a natural part of the food, but would you say it's a hazard? Salmon is very soft <coughs> bone. It's a soft bone, but yeah, I guess it's not. It's, it's soft bone is not gonna hurt you that much. Let's say it's like tilapia. You know, tilapia has these um, harder bones. Would you say that's a, it's a hazard? get up in your gums. It, it can, yeah. And, and the thing is, you know, when you buy boneless fish or boneless chicken, you're not expecting to see bone, no. right? So oh, although it is natural, it is still considered to be a, a hazard. Um, chemical hazards. So that's physical. We talked about biological. There's, uh, there's, there's, there's physical. There's also chemical, right? If your potato look green like that, yeah. see that? Mm -hmm. Don't eat it because it means that it has this phytochemical, it's solanine, which is toxic, it's poisonous, so you don't want to eat it. You guys familiar with, with uh, cassava or tapioca? Oh, no. Top, uh, yeah, it's called tapioca. It has cyanide in it. Again, okay, when it's processed, you know, that cyanide is, is removed, and so it is, it is safe. This is, <laughs> this, I put this fruit up here because I'm from Jamaica, and um, that's our national fruit. It's called ackee. And it, surprisingly, it's actually a poisonous fruit. But um, the poison, when it's cooked, the poison leaches out into the water. And, um, and by the time you're done cooking, all that poison is gone. You can eat the fruit. Don't drink the water, though, because the water has that, that toxin called hypoglycin. It's called hypoglycin because it drops your blood pressure. <laughs> so, so some chemicals in food, they're natural, but natural does not necessarily mean it's good, right? <laughs> they're natural, but uh, unsafe. Heavy metals like mercury, mer uh, pregnant women should be very careful of, of, of consuming certain types of fish, like shark, these top feeders, because you, as you go up the, the, the chain, the, 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 uh, the food chain, mercury accumulates, right? So you have the tiny little fish that will um, get the mercury inside of their tissue, and then guess what? They, a bigger fish will come along and eat that. And as you go up, the mercury content, it increases and increases. So uh, particularly a pregnant women are encouraged not to eat certain types of fish, including shark and pike and halibut. You guys familiar with allergens? People are allergic to different types of foods, right? So these are the eight big allergens that, you know, if someone has an allergic reaction to something, uh, when they eat, uh, it's probably one, one of these. There's also mycotoxins. These are moldy. If your food is moldy, you don't want to eat it. You know, growing up, I, I was familiar with this, you know, if, if the bread was moldy, guess what we did? Cut it off. Just cut off the moldy part. But you know what? Um, and I wasn't aware, I was a kid, you know, I didn't care. <laughs> but the toxins, these, these mold can produce toxins. While you may re remove the physical mold, the toxins may still be in the food. So like cheese? Um, it all depends on the type, it depends on the type of mold because for cheese some, is, is mold is essential yeah. for certain types of cheese. It provides the, 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 the flavor. So it, 
Um, it's a part of the process that's fine, but, but if I go in my fridge and I notice that my, my cheese is moldy, I'm gonna throw it out, right? Because <laughs> it's not supposed to be there, I don't, I, you know, but it's a part of the process, that's, that's, that's different. Pesticides as well, you know, that's a chemical hazard. Mm-hmm. Quickly enough, who is responsible to keep your, the food supply safe? <clears throat> all these government agencies, you've heard of the FDA, you've heard of the USDA, all of these individuals are, or agencies are responsible to keep our food safe, but who else? Who else do you think? Apart from the government, who else is responsible to keep our food safe? Who do you think? Yourself. Yeah, yourself, yeah. You're responsible, I mean, all of us, we're all in this together, right? The farmers, the processors, um, the regulatory agencies, but especially, me and you, right? We have to protect ourselves and also to protect and also protect our, our families. Uh, when it comes to workplace, and I'm going to go in depth with workplace um, food safety management rules because um, you know food companies have all sort of different rules and guidelines that they follow. You, you were talking about serve safe um, earlier, you know. So there's good manufacturing practices that involve things like personal hygiene and pest control, and cleaning and sanitation, waste management. They have all these policies that they put in place to keep their food uh, safe and to protect their consumers. Um, so serve safe is relevant to restaurants, cafeteria. Um, then there's, have you heard of this one? This, this one, hazard analysis, critical control points. We can just say HACCP. Any company that's producing Meat and meat products. That's a, another food safety system, just like how you have serve safe. That's another food safety system. Um, the last one here, hazard analysis and risk-based preventive controls, called it HARP-C. That one was implemented just a few years ago under the Food Safety Modernization Act uh, to manage uh, food safety in companies that don't produce meat, right? So we had a system that took care of meat and meat products, but what about the other companies that produce food? Now we have a system to uh, ensure that those companies, they're also following food safety guidelines. A foodborne outbreak is when two or more people get sick from eating the same food. That's an outbreak. And so, you know, you can imagine that food, food companies certainly don't want anyone to get um, any foodborne injuries, right? Because if just say two of us, you know, we come to this um, this potluck and we eat the same the same food, that's an outbreak, right? Even if a hundred people were here and only two of us ate the same sandwich with us, that's an outbreak. So <laughs> companies they don't want to hear that. That can that can really uh, that can close down their business. That's that's bad for them. I'm going to finish up with some general tips. What are some of the tips that we can use to prevent injuries at home? What can we do, right? Let's look at some practical stuff. Buy your food from safe sources. What are the safe sources? Walmart is a nice, good place. I shop at Walmart. I'm not promoting Walmart necessarily, but I mean, it's you know, Walmart, Kroger, Mayers, uh, any of these companies. Um, generally safe to shop at because they, they, they spend a lot of money and investing in food safety practices and principles and just making sure that their food is safe for their consumers, you know. So reputable places, right? Um, if it's a place that is not being monitored, not being regulated, it's just a, you know, a little place that someone is just doing his thing, right? Or her farmer thing markets. and it's not regulated, huh? There's farmer markets. There's farmer's but market. they are regulated. They're not regulated Safe. for, they, they are? Some. some some of them are regulated cottage rules mm-hmm yeah so if you if if, if it is and you know cottage yeah cottage scale yeah right that's what you mentioned that's yeah right. yeah there there are cottage rules and that's, that's governed under goods in that. the health department that oversees that um and so yeah yeah so those those companies are small businesses are safe to support but if you don't have any any idea as to where this company is from, what they're doing, um, I don't know. Oh. I, I, I would be careful, right? Oh, the guy on the street selling meat. Yeah. 
he, he could be a roadkill or something, you know. <laughs> a road, <laughs> can you imagine people actually do that? You know, people eat roadkill. <laughs> no, <laughs> but there are people who do that. Um, so buy from safe sources, and uh, most of the places around here, including um, the, the farmers market, are the safe places to to to, to support and to and to buy. Now, hear this. Please know that date marks, when you see a best before, a best buy, it is, it's not gonna protect you from foodborne illnesses. Do you know that this has nothing to do with food safety? We normally think that, oh, you know, once I buy this product before, it's, it's, if I use this product before it's expiry date, it is safe. No, <coughs> this, this mark is on there basically to say that if you consume the product before that date, is you're gonna get the best quality in terms of taste, in terms of smell, in terms of appearance. It's all sensory. It has nothing to do with bacteria and virus and you know food safety. So um, I know a lot of people put their faith in best before date, but this just to let you just to let you know. When you go to the grocery, here's another important tip. When you go to the do you guys do this? Do you separate your meat when you're in your grocery, you know, you're, you're pushing your cart, you separate your meat from your vegetables? I normally put my um, meat at the bottom. My meat goes at the bottom and all the ready to eat stuff at, at, at top. Uh, so it's important to do that. And when you're standing at Walmart, when you're standing at Kroger's, and that person is bagging your groceries, <laughs> keep your eyes open. Right? Because sometimes, and they usually do a very good job at separating, you know, they have been trained and they usually do a good job, but sometimes, you know, they will slip and they may put a ready-to-eat food in, uh, in, with your chicken or with your beef. So you want to catch that, right? You, you want to keep them separate when you go into your car to, you know, you take your stuff to the car, you want to keep them separate as, as well. So that's, that's going to be important. Make sure that you follow label instructions. A lot of foodborne illnesses happen not at the restaurant but at home, right? So you want to make sure that you uh, follow instructions like refrigerate after opening. <laughs> you see that? Refrigerate after open. Um, this one says once open, promptly refrigerate. So things, things like that, right? Cooking instructions, temperatures. You want to observe. You want to, you know. That's why uh, the information is there to protect you, right? <laughs> Here's a big rule that everybody should follow. Keep cold foods cold and hot foods hot. Can we say that? Keep cold foods cold and hot foods hot. It's easy to, to remember. Why is that? Because remember, most bacteria that cause people to get sick, they tend to be, we call them mesophiles. They tend to live within this range here of 40 to 140 degrees degrees Fahrenheit, right? So that range is called the danger zone because a lot of the pathogens, they live within this, this region. And so guess what? You want to either chill your food or freeze it, keep the temperature low, or keep it high, right? So if you're operating in a restaurant and you're operating that steam table, make sure the temperature on that steam table is, you know, it, it, it's, it's kept hot. If you're, I mean, that's why we use crock pots, right? We need to keep our foods warm. Uh, to prevent bacteria from, from growing. Here's some temperatures. If you want to, so poultry, I highlighted poultry because we do a lot of turkey here, right? <laughs> I think I probably gave this presentation here close to Thanksgiving time, and so I highlighted that. So 165, know that number for, the, for this year when we're having Thanksgiving. The temperature uh, of that turkey, the coldest spot, it should be 165. You guys use thermometers? Hopefully you do, all right, good. So, and there are a wide range of thermometers and you, know, you can get some like for 10 bucks. I mean, they're, they're, they're really cheap and available. And where do you stick that turkey? Meatiest part. The meatiest part, yeah, because the meatiest part, that's the part that's gonna heat up the slowest, right? So it's generally right on the breast there. Some, some people do the, in between the thighs, you know. I have a question. Yeah. If you stick a frozen piece of meat, Mm -hmm. into your crop pot. Is there a time period when you're endangering before it gets up to a certain? Because a lot of people yeah. do that, throw it in so they can go to work. When yeah, there's going to be that. There's going to be a period where you're in the danger zone. And so if 
if you're going to keep it in that data zone for too long, and typically, um, I mean, up to four hours, four hours in the day, after four hours in the data zone, you certainly don't want to eat that, that food. You throw it out, right? You take your, your milk out and you leave it on the counter for four hours, don't, don't drink it. So there is that, so, but it may not be long, it may be not that long, right? If the crock pot is hot enough, it may thaw quickly enough to, to stay outside of the, the danger zone. You know, uh, it's certainly not gonna be in the danger zone for four hours in a properly run crock pot. I think yeah. it should be hot enough. Uh, but in terms of, the right thing to do is to thaw the thing first, right? Thaw it <laughs> before just throwing it in, in the crock, crock pot. And speaking of that, how did you know that that was the next slide? <laughs> We're gonna talk about thawing. How do you thaw? Well, you can thaw, thaw in the turkey, thaw in the refrigerator. You can thaw in, in a cold water as well, or running water, um, but the general guide is to just thaw in your refrigerator. And notice that the, the, the turkey is in a container. Why do you think that's in a container? To prevent what? No. Dripping and getting a, making a mess, and dripping into your vegetables that you may be storing beneath here. So yeah, so thaw, and you have to plan ahead, right? That's that's very important. Plan meat thawing ahead of time because these turkeys they're big, right? I mean they're gonna take how many days? One, two days sometimes, <laughs> to, you know, to, to thaw. So just plan, planning ahead is, is is very important as we just we talk about food safety. If you are sick. Stay out of the kitchen. If you're preparing food for yourself, that's fine. If you're preparing food for your kids or other folks, stay out of the kitchen. Why is that? Because you may just be sick with um, a foodborne um, pathogen, right? If, you, if you're experiencing these symptoms, right? You're vomiting, um, you're having diarrhea, things like those, those are indications of a potential foodborne illness you probably should not be paying food for, for other people. You know, ideally, right? <laughs> ideally. Um, and and if, you, if you have to, it, you have to take so much care to prevent uh, the food from, from being contaminated. Keep your kitchen clean. What a pretty kitchen, look at that. Wow, this is a nice kitchen. You certainly want to keep it clean. Um, I, I must tell you that sometimes um, when I'm cooking, um, I make a mess and by the time I'm done, I have a project on my hand, right? What do they tell you to do? Clean as you go. Clean as you go. I try to do that, but sometimes, you know, stuff pile up. <laughs> but clean as you go, yeah. Um, otherwise, you, you run the risk of, of cost contamination. Um, I like this. I, I, I got one of these um, from, from Walmart. Uh, maybe 50 bucks or so but they're neat right because they're hands-free stainless steel is good so easy to clean and hands-free so have a garbage container like that that's hands hands-free doesn't necessarily have to be stainless steel but you know in, when we're working in the kitchen we we touch the garbage we have to throw stuff you know out so regularly use a hands hands-free um, uh, tool like that um, paper towels Okay, paper towels versus cloth. Which one should you use? Why paper towels and not cloth? I mean, which one is going to be cheaper? If you're using the same cloth for the whole time, it's going to be cheaper than how much is expensive. They're good, but they're expensive. So, why should we use this? Well, it's disposable, right? And some of these are so good that you can actually, you can actually rinse it. And reuse it, right? Some of them, depending on the, the, the type. Um, disposables, these are good. You wipe the surface, you get rid of that. No possibility of, of cross contamination, or at least less. And with a cloth, if you're going to use a cloth, keep it soaked in bleach, in some bleach water. You can use a cloth, but make sure you have some bleach water and you keep that soaked in. Otherwise, you know, you use this, just less, less headache, less, less hassle. Um, Bleach is really good at sanitizing stuff. Right? There are other sanitizers, but bleach is really effective in killing bacteria and killing, killing viruses. Have the separate cutting boards for raw and ready to eat foods. Do we do that? Separate cutting boards. It's ideal, and some people even color code them. Look at that. So 
So we have white and we have yellow. I mean, this, yeah. So that's that's best. You certainly want to keep them separate to prevent cross cont contamination. So what if you just have, what if you just have one cutting board, and you had to cut up meat and vegetables? Which one would you cut first? Vegetables. Vegetables first. That's right. And then once you're done with that and you put it away, you can cut your your meat. Yeah. And then washing hands. This is so, it's so simple. It's so very, very important. Washing hands. How long should we wash your hands? Or what does the FDA or the CDC say? How long? How many seconds? Sing happy birthday. 30 seconds. 30, 30, yeah, between 20 to 30 seconds. Sing the happy birthday song. Yeah, happy birthday to you. By the time you're done, it's about 20, 30 seconds. And usually when we're washing your hands, guess what? Guess where we focus? In the middle, right? But what about these areas, right? Where you have bacteria as well. So you certainly want to do that. Uh, and in the food industry, I mean, they, I mean, they go all out. They go all the way up here. <laughs> yeah, in, in in food manufacturing, they they wash all the way, all the way up. So, washing hands is very important. But when, when should you wash your hands? Certainly after going to the toilet. Remember, a lot of these pathogens are caused by exposure to fecal material. So. After you use the toilet, if you touch the garbage, if you touch your hair or skin or lick your fingers, this is one of the things that I don't like seeing. If I am at a buffet or a potluck, you know, sometimes I see people in front of me. I mean, I, I'm waiting to serve my meat, and they will use a spoon. They will take their food up, right, and you know, some food might spill on their finger, and they lick it, right, and then touch that utensil again that I'm going to use. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like seeing that. Well, people do that. You know, it's it's not a good practice to, to, to be licking your fingers while you're preparing food or even when you're collecting food. Uh, if you're handling utensils, like other people will be, be handling. So avoid doing that. I mean, you want to wash your hands after you blow your nose, sneeze, cough. By the way, it is said that, okay, you should cough in your um, elbow. Don't cough in your hand. Which, which, which is best? Which, what? If you cough in your in your in your uh, on your clothes here, I mean the bacteria they, they don't go away; they're still there, right? Yeah. If you cough in your hands, you can wash it. <laughs> so which one should you do? So you would you rather cough in your hands and wash it, or cough here and the bacteria is still there? Somebody comes and they touch you and they can they can transfer it. <laughs> Something to think about, right? Yeah. Yeah. Because of the emergency, it's just like. Yeah, it, that's an emergency. Yeah. The quickest thing. <laughs> that's the quickest thing, yeah. Uh, you sort of want to wash your hands after touching animals. Um, and was, a lot of people are pet lovers, right? And they would be in the kitchen, they're handling their cats and handling their dogs and handling food. So, no, no, no. Pets should wait, right? Wait their turn while you're preparing, preparing food because, you know, they're, they can do that, that transfer as well. Wash your hands between handling raw meat and preparing ready to, to eat foods. If you have a sick person that you're taking <coughs> care of, um, you might have to be taking care of that person. You're in the kitchen, kind of back and forth. Uh, make sure you wash your hands after caring for, for that, that person. Uh, and that person may be a baby, right? <laughs> changing, your di changing diapers. Make sure you, you, uh, you wash your hands after, after that. All right. So those are some quick tips, and I almost took an hour. <laughs> but let me wrap up with um, these two slides. This is a summary of what we talked about. So common causes of foodborne illnesses. Well, I would give you, usually at this time, I give the students a test, right? <laughs> but we don't have any time to give a test. So let's just summarize real quick. So um, causes of foodborne illnesses. Number one, there's improper holding temperatures, so keeping foods at the wrong temperature. Remember, keep cold food is cold and hot food is hot, right? Um, so in, improper temperatures, um, dirty contaminated uh, utensils and equipment, uh, poor health practices, poor hygiene, and buying from unsafe sources. So recommendations, what should we do to keep our food safe? Keep, again, keep hot, you gotta remember this, all right? <laughs> keep hot foods hot and cold foods cold. Uh, cook to proper temperatures. So invest in a thermometer, especially for Thanksgiving and for other uh, foods uh, as well. 
uh, observe proper hygiene practices, including washing your hands. Uh, prepare food in a clean and a sanitary environment. Separate raw from cooked. Buy from safe sources. So these are um, some recommendations for you. Uh, and sorry, I had to go through them quickly. But um, I believe in the. I'm going to leave the, the PowerPoint. And so if you if you want it, you can um, contact the library, and the library will be able to to send that that to you. All right. Well. Before I say thank you very much, any question before I wrap up? If you do get a contaminated ingest, mm -hmm. is there a, like a cycle of certain that it's in your system? Like when you have no diarrhea and the vomiting? Mm -hmm. Is there a certain time period that it finally makes it through and you feel better? There, there is a time period. So um, some, sometimes, some, sometimes we assume that because we're not seeing the symptoms, we're fine. Um, the bacteria could still be in your in your system, and so you know when you get an antibiotic, you know some people they will get antibiotics, and okay, let's say they, it's, the prescription is seven days, and before seven days is up, um, you feel all right, and you stop taking your, your antibiotic. Don't do that. Go through right, finish, and that's how um, people get this you know, resistance to antibiotics because the bacteria they're not killed yet, but you stop too early, right? So it, yeah, there is a time. There might be a few days. Right, so make sure you finish your, your, your prescription. Yeah, so, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. And we see that with, with COVID too, right? Um, after the symptoms are gone, there is, there is that time period, right? You, you still need to stay away, right, from other people before, before you know, resuming your normal life. <laughs> All right, any, any more? If you have any questions, please send it to the library, and I'll be happy to respond to, to, to them. Or just, just ask them on Facebook, and I'll respond to them, right? I'll I look up for your questions on, on Facebook, and I'll respond. So thank you, guys. Um, it was nice to have an audience here, because an audience online. So.